Okay, well, we're going to start anyway, and then we'll see if the first speaker comes by the time we get to. I think Beryl is making some introductory announcements. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for registering for today's meeting, um, uh, both for those of you present here and for those on the webinar. So this evening, uh, we're going to cover uh, aesthetic medicine, uh, and it's an overview of aesthetic medicine, and we're also going to cover body dysmorphic disorder. Um, so as I said before, my name is Beryl D'Souza, and I'm an honorary clinical senior lecturer in plastic surgery at Imperial College, and I'm also honorary secretary of the BMA Enfield and Haringey division. And I particularly chose these titles to be used today because I think it's really important for us to understand that the BMA, apart from being our trade union and our organisation as medics, is so instrumental in providing us with CPD um, in order for us to learn. And I'm very cheered by the fact that in the room we have people here of different ages and different nationalities and different specialities too. And it's a good learning environment. Uh, and obviously we have those on, on the um, webinar as well. And I think for all of you out there, understand that teaching is really important. Uh, and as doctors, we should really try and see when we can start teaching from an early uh, point in our careers, from the time we're medical students all the way to when we, we uh, reach higher levels in education. So I'd encourage you to, to think about uh, education as you go along and perhaps volunteering, volunteering to come and speak at some of these CPD events here uh, on topics that you think would be interesting too. So I chose this topic because I thought the BMA have been running these CPD events now for about five years. And Andrew Barton, sitting on the right over there, and Emma uh, are responsible as the secretary to actually organize the, the event. And we've got at the back of the room there our IT experts who um, uh, get the, the webinar out to all the folks sitting in their, their rooms or in hospitals to learn from this event. So I think from, from a sort of um, educational point of view, uh, um, do give ideas for other CPD events that you want. Um, I particularly wanted to cover aesthetic medicine because I'm a plastic surgeon and I thought it would be a good topic to cover. But it's not just aesthetic medicine we're covering tonight because we're also covering a bit uh, on body dysmorphic uh, disorder and we have a psychiatrist in the room too. So it's going to be a very interesting event um, and, and I'm very pleased that we've got some excellent speakers who've had to work really hard. Now, all of this is done by people who are volunteering to teach their colleagues. So they have spent time and effort to put together, and it's a tall order, they were given just 20 minutes to put together a, a very complex subject. Uh, and I'm very grateful to them for all the hard work that they, they've put into to this. Um, but before we start, what I'd like to do is um, uh, talk about the importance of aesthetic medicine uh, from the point of view of guidelines. So in 2016, the GMC put forward guidelines, and this was based on the PIP scandal that happened uh, a few years before that, and this ended up with a, a review by Sir Bruce Keel uh, on cosmetic surgery. Uh, and subsequent to that, the GMC put forward the, the guidelines uh, in 2016. And what I've done is just put an overview of, of, of the guidelines and so going through them briefly so uh, it's to do with advertising and marketing services responsibly considering patients psychological needs giving patients time for reflection seeking a patient's consent providing continuity of care and supporting patients safety and lastly keeping up to date now um, the other important documents and these will all be on the slides that you can download, uh, are here, uh, and there are links attached to them. And you'll see they vary. So the Royal College of Surgeons of England came up with another document about the same time as the GMC guidelines in 2016. Um, and around uh, 2015, NHS Health Education England put together a number of documents with a big 
think tank group of, of various specialties to look at qualification requirements for delivery of cosmetic procedures. And I urge you to have a look at that document. It's a very interesting document, uh, followed by this, the other one on implementation of qualification requirements for cosmetic uh, procedures. And then uh, our plastic surgery organizations, both BAPRAs and BAPs, have also put together codes of practice, and they're available on their website. Uh, and then we've got um, the Committee of Advertising Practice that also uh, has a document out there. So what I'd like you to do from today is, is listen to our speakers and, and do please fill in the, the form, and it's a specially designed form to look at reflection to see what you learn from this event, and, and then you get your three CPDs, which is, is great and it's free. Uh, so uh, I hope you enjoy this event. So what I'd like to do first is Alex in the room. Um, if not, what... Uh, I want to do is uh, introduce our first speaker, and he's a colleague of mine, uh, and it's either Gwen Misia, uh, and I'm going to let you uh, put in your own introduction, Ivo, so thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I would like to thank Beryl for inviting me to um, give this lecture. What I've done is I will just briefly talk about myself very quickly, and then I'll speak about the new guidelines on the practice of aesthetic surgery. Then I'll also share with you some of my experiences in um, aesthetic surgery. So I'll, I'll divide it into breast, body, and face. And I'll also talk about potential fit, uh, pitfalls while practicing um, aesthetic surgery. So I'm a graduate of Manchester University. I've got a BSc in Immunology and Oncology, an MSc in Surgical Sciences from the University College here in London. I've got the membership of the Royal College of Surgeons, the Fellowship of uh, the Royal College of Surgeons in Plastic Surgery, I'm, and I'm also a holder of the United States Medical License and Exams. I did my plastic surgery training here in London. Then I subsequently worked within the Department of Craniofacial Surgery at Great Ormond Street during 2011, and then left for the US uh, in 2013 and 14 to do another Craniofacial Surgery Fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic. At the present time, I'm in private practice, and my practice offers 90% uh, uh, aesthetic uh, surgery pr uh, procedures and 10% reconstructive procedures. So over the co course of the last um, two to three years, there have been some new regulations um, affecting the practice of aesthetic surgery. So the General Medical Council, uh, in coordination with the four royal colleges, have come up with some guidelines. Uh, patients are now encouraged to do research on the procedures they are about to embark on, to research the surgeon and the facility where the procedure will be done. I'd invite everyone to have a look at the Royal College of Surgeons in England, their website on cosmetic surgery standards. They've got all the rules there. Now, for patients, in terms of selecting the surgeon, the patients need to make sure that the uh, surgeon is registered with the General Medical Council. The, sur the surgeon must hold a license to practice, so there is a website, so www.gmcuk.org forward slash register. They need to check the surgeon's uh, registration status. They also need to make sure that the surgeon they are seeing is the one actually carrying out the procedure. For example, if you go to some of these cosmetic companies, you'll find that you'll, you'll meet coordinators who are not the ones doing the surgery, and they'll be telling you something totally different to what the actual surgeon will be telling you. The patients would need to make sure that the surgeon has actually done the procedure before. The patient should ask how many of those procedures the surgeon has done. Importantly, the surgeon needs to now have medical indemnity and insurance to cover all the work they do. Patients also need to inquire how long the procedure will take, how long the recovery process will be, and whether there will be any follow-up arrangements. In terms of the facilities, so the hospitals or the clinics, um, patients need to make sure that the facility is registered with the relevant regulatory body. In England, we've got the Care Quality Commission, in Northern Ireland, we've got the Regulation and Quality Improvement Authority. In Scotland, we've got Healthcare Improvement Scotland. And in Wales, we've got Healthcare Inspectorate of Wales. So I've given all the websites um, on the slide. 
I will now share with you some of my experiences um, over, the course of, over the course of the last two years. I've had my own practice for two years now. And I'm going to you know, start off by explaining some of the breast procedures that I carry out. So I do breast augmentation, breast reduction, mastopexy combined with, at times, mastopexy, mastopexy augmentation, and then gynecomastia and congenital breast anomalies. Feel free to stop me and ask any questions if you know, you're not following what I'm saying. So for breast um, augmentation, what are the indications for breast augmentation? It's essentially to increase the breast volume. Now, how do you create the pocket for the implant? So you could either do an inframammary incision, and normally do a five centimeter long incision, just one centimeter below the inframammary crease. You could do a periareolar incision, that's around the nipple areola complex, if you're trying to reduce the size of the nipple areola complex. You could go transaxillary, so through the axilla, or you could go through the belly button, but you know, I've never done the belly button. Um, the implant can be placed in either under the breast, under the muscle, or under both muscle and breast. We call that dual plane. Very important, anybody doing aesthetic surgery needs to understand and fully explain to the patients the risks involved. You know, people think it's, you know, fun. It's, you know, it's quite, there's a lot of risks associated. So with breast augmentation in particular, you need to warn the patients about infection. It's about two to three percent. Bleeding, hematomas, unfavorable scars, implant rupture, and then capsular contracture in the long term. Capsular contracture is when you get scar tissue forming, forming around the implant. And after four to five years, you know, it, it becomes quite hard and it distorts the implant. A breast augmentation now increasingly is being carried out by the transfer of fat. It's a uh, procedure that was described in France. It's becoming quite commonplace now. So I'll also show you some pictures. So I've got a lady here who came to see me. She's in her 40s, I think. And she'd lost quite a lot of uh, breast uh, volume from the upper pole of the breast. So after I'm getting all the measurements, and I also use the 3D scan in my practice that, that allows me to show the patient what they would look like after the implant has been put in. So we opted for a 300 cc uh, moderate plus profile implant, and this was placed in, uh, in the dual plane, so partly on that muscle, partly on that gland. So she's got a fairly decent result. That's after six months. So the next procedure, breast reduction. So breast reduction is essentially for um, you know, what you call macromastia, so large breasts. And these patients you know, really do suffer from you know, back pain. You know, uh, they can't find clothes that fit them correctly. They can't exercise. They get harassment from the opposite sex. So it's really a procedure to um, remove the excess breast tissue. Now, <clears throat> you could classify breast reduction into the the type of pedicle. The pedicle is essentially the, uh, the bit of the breast that maintains the blood supply. So the blood supply could either be superior or medial, and I'll show you in, in a subsequent uh, picture. It could be medial, superior, inferior, central. And the incisions could be vertical, vertical with a small horizontal scar or an inverted T, and I'll show you too. Again, no procedure is risk-free. The risks for breast reduction include infection, Bleeding, scarring, nipple loss, uh, altered nipple sensation, inability to breastfeed, that's a big one, breast asymmetry, and fat necrosis. Fat necrosis essentially is because you're um, taking away the blood supply to most of the breast tissue, the fat actually dies, but then it calcifies. So the poor lady may turn up a few weeks later with heart lumps in the breast. Breast reduction can also be performed with liposuction. So I've got a picture of two ladies. The one on the left is a lady who required a small reduction. So I've, she's got a superior uh, medial pedicle. Um, so that pedicle just there. So the, 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 the um, largest blood uh, vessel is the third intercostal vessel, and it runs somewhere along there. So what you do is you then cut this out, and that preserves the blood supply, and then you rotate it into that little circle. That's called a snowman. The lady on the, on the right, sorry, is um, she's got a larger breast, so I've, instead of using a, a vertical scar, I've used an inverted T. It's called a wise pattern. And again, I've, I've used a superior medial pedicle. To, uh, it's got the best blood supply, and it also made, uh, gives the best sensation. So I've just shown a picture of you know, a patient in theater undergoing a breast reduction procedure. So the right side's been done, on the picture on the left, 
and the left side still to be down, and both sides have now been down. So you can actually see the difference in size of the breasts once the, once the reduction has been done. We got a lady here that's six months apart, so that's November last year and May this year, so a fairly significant reduction. I think that was 900 grams. And she, you know, she can now wear nice clothes, she goes running. Before, she couldn't do that. She had significant back pain. The next breast procedure is mastopexy. That's called a breast uplift. It's essentially to correct breast ptosis. So ptosis is when the nipple areola co uh, complex is sitting below the inframammary crease, and I'll show you in a picture. So we can do uh, a few. There are several incisions that have been described. In my practice, I use the periareola or the vertical scar of the wise pattern. Again, it comes with risks, unfavorable scars, infection, nipple loss, breast asymmetry. In certain cases, the patients may also ask for filling up of the upper pole of the breast. And you've really got to listen to what they're saying. Otherwise, you do a mastopexy, and they'll come back three months very, very unhappy, saying it feels empty. So you need to really find out from them. Do you want your breast to be lifted up and some volume added, or do you just want an uplift? So we got a young lady in her early 20s who, for some unknown reason, had lost quite a lot of breast tissue in the upper pole. And you can see that's a grade three uh, ptosis. So it's, it's at the inferior border of the breast contour. And she really wanted something to be done. She felt embarrassed. She wouldn't let her partner see her breasts. So I did a vertical scar mastopexy, and that's three months later. So it's back. The, nipple are, the nipples are sitting at the level of the inframammary fold. Gynecomastia. So gynecomastia, that's excess breast tissue in a male. Um, some of these patients really do suffer. They, they can't you know, sit with their friends, they can't go swimming, they can't change in the changing room, they feel really embarrassed. Um, the causes are either idiopathic, pathologic, and pharmacologic. You need to really you know, spend time with the patient, you know, actually you know, find out what the, the possible causes are. You actually send them for blood tests as well. So treatment options are liposuction alone. Or you could use ultrasound-assisted liposuction if they've got a fibrous breast tissue. You could do a periareolar resection, or, or in severe cases, a, a breast reduction. Again, the risks on favorable scarring. I've had cases where you know, the scars stretch, because as soon as you do it, they go back to the gym. They start lifting weights. And then they come back, and the scar looks awful. So you need to warn them about that. So there's also the risk of nipple loss and loss of nipple sensation. So I got a young man who previously had um, gynecomastia correction elsewhere, came back to see, came to see me and said he wasn't happy, he still felt he had some uh, breast tissue there. So I did liposuction, ultrasound assisted liposuction with a simultaneous periareolar resection of the residual breast tissue. So that's at two weeks, so he's still, he's still a bit bruised, but he had a really good outcome. Now congenital breast anomaly. I've seen a few in my time. Some of them can be quite you know, terrible. And I'll show you a picture of a young lady who, who came to see me um, 18 months ago. So it's, it's essentially an, an abnormal uh, breast development. And they can present as either constricted breast or tubular breasts. And you can correct them by either doing a breast reduction or, or a reduction augmentation or differential augmentation. So differential augmentation is when you put different size implants on the breasts. Or you do a combination of either augmentation or reduction or a differential augmentation. The risks here include on scarring, real problem, and then breast asymmetry. Some of these patients are quite difficult. They may need, you need to warn them, they may need two or three stages to finally get an excellent outcome. So we've got a young lady here with a severely constricted left breast and a, a tubular breast on the, on the right side. You can actually see on the side view, on the quarter view, how, how bad that was. She couldn't go out, you know, she couldn't find any clothes that fitted her. So I did a differential augmentation with um, scoring of the, there's a fibrous ring at the base of uh, that breast. That, that's what causes that tubular appearance. So she had a 325cc implant on the left side with a 250 on the right side. She was very happy. So uh, 14 months later, she got a new tattoo because she was so happy. And I said, um, listen, yes, it's much improved, but that nipple areola complex on the right side Sits a bit lower, so we need, you know, could we just do a little uplift there to get you, you know, some symmetrization? She said, No, doctor, I'm very happy. 
you know, I'm very happy, I can get clothes now, I can go out with my friends. So the reason for showing this slide is you have to listen to what the patient wants. You know, you may think, okay, I'm going to do a mastopexy, I'm a super surgeon, I know what's best for the patient. No, you've got to listen to what the patient wants. So she had one stage and she was very happy and that was it, she was discharged. So now we go to body procedures. So I'll talk about brachioplasty, so that's an arm lift, liposuction, body contouring with fat transfer and abdominoplasty. So um, <clears throat> patients would come for, a, for an arm lift or a brachioplasty if they've got excess tissue in the upper arms and it's commonly seen after significant weight loss. So the incisions, again, the, the several incisions have been described. The common ones that I use are posterior, media, long shot, or a combination of any of those. Um, you need to be very, very careful when doing this. Um, if you're very aggressive with liposuction, for example, you could damage the brachial plexus. So nerve injuries are common. You need to be careful. Or vascular injuries. And then the scar, you need to warn them about the scar because that takes a really long time to settle. So we got a lady here who turned up to see me. She'd been going, you know, she'd been looking for a surgeon, couldn't find any surgeon. She saw me, I think it was second week in December last year, and she said, Doctor, I want this corrected for Christmas. <laughs> and I said, no, it's a two-stage procedure, or three even. She said, no, one stage. I said, okay, fine. I said, but we need to do some liposuction. So you can liposuction with a simultaneous uh, excision of excess tissue. So you can actually see how much fat we took out just through liposuction, almost 700 cc's per arm. And then we took that amount of skin off. And it, we didn't really get a perfect result, so I had to repeat it again in the summer. And that just shows, you know, you need to, um, some of these procedures really need to be staged. You do the liposuction first, you wait for the skin to retract, and then you remove the excess skin. We've got another patient here who had a one stage, you know, resection, just resection alone, and that's how six months later. I think it's a fairly decent outcome. Liposuction. So what's liposuction? It's the mechanical extraction of fat from the subcutaneous tissues. So the indications are patients will present with excess subcutaneous fat, or you could also do it if you're trying to harvest the fat for fat grafting. It's used for breast reduction or in extravasation injuries. Several types of machines now available. Um, there are power-assisted machines, so the micro-air, ultrasound, so VASA, ProMelta. Um, you could also do superficial or intermediate or deep liposuction. You need to warn them about the risks, so infection, bleeding, asymmetry, altered sensation, bruising, fluid shifts. I've got colleagues who do six, seven liters in one go, very dangerous. You shouldn't do more than three at a time. I'll, once I get three liters out, I stop. And then you need to warn them about lax, baggy skin. So we got a lady here who came. She said she wanted vasal liposuction. She knew exactly what she wanted. We did it. Six weeks later, I think she looks quite good. So we took out three liters. I stopped after three liters. So fat transfer. So I don't know if anyone follows social media. All the girls now want fat grafting to the bottoms. They want the S curve, the Kim Kardashian look. There's a lot of girls asking for this procedure now. Um, it, and essentially it's to improve the body shape and the body appearance. So you would do liposuction to the buttocks, the, um, and then take the fat and inject into the, um, into the uh, liposuction, I'm sorry, on the abdomen, the flanks, and the back, and inject it into the buttocks. Other areas that can also have liposuction include breast and face and upper limbs. So you need to warn them about infection, poor graft take. If they are smokers, very dangerous, don't do it. And then fat necrosis and lumpiness and asymmetry. So that's just as myself doing a fat transfer case. So that's the, one of the ultrasound devices we use, the ProMelta, it's a new machine. So we treat the area with the device for a good 20 minutes, then we harvest the fat, it goes into a closed system called the Aquavash, and then we then get the fat into syringes and then inject into the buttocks. You can see that side, the right side's just about been injected. So we, we inject it um, and then eventually do both sides. You advise them not to sit down for two weeks. It's, it's, it's a long time. <laughs> but they don't. They say, I will not sit down and they sit. And then come and say, oh, I'm flat. So that's a young lady who had, you know, so you can see the change. So nice hourglass shape. So all the red areas are where the fat was removed and all the green areas where the fat was injected. So abdominoplasty, so tummy tuck. 
So it's best for a lady to do this, um, essentially removing excess fat and skin from the abdominal wall, and it's best for a lady to do this once they've finished having their family. It's commonly combined with um, liposuction. There are several types of incisions you can do depending on the habitus of the patient. So a bikini line incision, a fleur de lis, if they've lost significant amounts of weight. So a regnant or a gold wing. And you need to warn them about seroma, wound problems, especially if they're a smoker. I've had wounds break down in patients who smoke. You need to be very careful about those. Asymmetry, dog ears, and the scar problem. You need, you need to really uh, warn them about that. So we got a lady who came with a small, you know, excess abdominal tissue, so she had it removed with plication of the recti. She also had simultaneous breast augmentation at the same time. So that's uh, six months later, and the scar is fading quite nicely. So she had a low scar, bikini line type scar. Now I'll, now I'll now finish up with the face and the neck. So I'll talk about brow lift, blepharoplasty, that's removing excess skin around the eyelids, otoplasty, that's ear pinning, face lift, neck lift, rhinoplasty, and finally, genio, finally genioplasty. So brow lift, it's essentially the surgical elevation of the brow to its normal position. Um, the indications are brow tosis, so that's when the brow sits lower than where it should be. In a man, the brow should be at the level of the supraorbital ridge, and in a woman, it should be about a centimeter higher. And then in patients with facial palsy as well, where the facial nerve stops working, they get brow ptosis, so uh, brow lift could be indicated in that situation. The types of brow lifts are endoscopic, which I tend to do a lot of those, Hairline, where you actually do, for those with high hairline, so if the distance from the brow to the hairline is more than nine centimeters, you really have to consider doing a hairline type uh, brow lift. Or you could do a corona, where you make do an incision from one ear to the other, and then undermine, go to the subperitial level and undermine the rest of the face to raise the, um, the brows. Or you could do a surgical or a transpire, or direct or transpire pre-brow through the eyebrow itself. So the complications here include asymmetry of the brows, numbness, recurrent ptosis, alopecia, so hair loss, where you place your incisions, and scarring. So we got a lady uh, who saw me, she wasn't happy, she said she felt, she looked really tired, and her brow was a bit low. So that's how just before surgery, with all the indications, the temporal crest marked out in the sentinel vein. The other thing you need to watch out for is the cause of the frontal branch of the facial nerve runs from the ear lobe to the uh, lateral aspect of the brow. So you, you can either do a three hole or a five hole brow lift. I do a five hole and I also combine it with a lateral brow lift. So that's the lady six months later, looking a bit different, looking a bit better. Blepharoplasty. So it's removal of skin, excess skin from the upper eyelid and or the lower eyelid. So the indications are when the patient's requesting for facial rejuvenation. Um, in patients, you know, especially lorry drivers who have significant ptosis uh, of the brow or excess skin on the eyelids where they can't actually see from the, on the corner because the skin's so low. And then it's also used as an adjunct to a facelift procedure. It could either be an upper eyelid, lower eyelid, or combined, both. I'm not gonna go into all the technical details, it gets a bit boring. So the risks here, infection, dry eyes, like ophthalmos is when you've taken off too much skin and they can't close the eye. You need to be really, really careful about, you know, about that. And then conjunctival bruising, scarring, and you need to warn them for the lower eyelid about blindness. But it's got an incidence of 0.04%, but it's a possibility it can happen. So I got a young lady who came to see me. She felt she had excess skin, with some dermatocalysis. So we did uh, a pinch blepharoplasty for the lower eyelid and a standard upper eyelid uh, blepharoplasty. And um, she's got, a, I think, a fairly good result at six months. Otoplasty, so ear pinning. Um, indications are for prominent ear. Prominent ear is usually a consequence of the absence of the antihelical fold. I'll show you in the next patient. So there are several techniques have been described. So cartilage excision, cartilage scoring, suture techniques or combination. I tend to use suture techniques. It, uh, they work well in my hands. Um, risks include infection, bleeding, scarring, inadequate correction, and the need for revision. So once I've done a case, I'll put them in this uh, little dressing, soft wool and a crepe, and I keep it on for one week. So it keeps them comfortable, and it reduces the amount of oozing. So I've got a young lady who came to see me. So you can actually see from the back view as well, her ears really stick out. We did a suture technique, and that's her, um, I think six months later, 
So all the air is pinned in. And then from the quarter view, you can actually see the anti-helical folds being recreated with the sutures. So that pins the air back in. Facelift. Surgical rejuvenation of the aging face. It's also known as a rhytidectomy. Rhytids are wrinkles, so it, you know, getting rid of the wrinkles. Several types of facelifts have been described. So subcutaneous is a skin-only facelift. Nobody really does that because it's got a high recurrence rate. SMAS-based facelifts, deep plane facelifts, and subperiosteal. Um, in my practice, I do mainly SMAS-based uh, SMAS facelifts. So you could do a SMASectomy, where you take out a little rectangular wedge of the SMAS. We could do a SMAS plication where you run a stitch along uh, from the lateral aspect of the eye right down to the angle of the jaw. Or a high SMAS where you elevate the SMAS and then suture it above the level of the zygomatic arch. Or um, you raise the SMAS and you keep it below the level of the um, zygomatic arch and imbricate it. So it's called a low SMAS. It's commonly combined with fat grafting. Why? Because the fat incorporates new blood supply to the face and it makes a whole difference to the patients. Again, risks, infection, bleeding, scarring, alopecia, facial nerve damage. You need to warn them about that. So I got a young gentleman um, who came to see me looking quite emaciated with involution of the mid face. So he had a, um, a plan to do a SMAS-based facelift, opened him up, there was no SMAS. So we did a subcutaneous facelift and I put some fat in and it made a world of a difference. Another lady, again in her 50s, felt she looked a bit tired. Same thing, smart based facelift uh, with fat grafting to the mid face. Neck lift, that's rejuvenation of the neck area. Usually done through a facelift incision. You need to address the platysma, and there's several ways for addressing the platysma. So I got a lady here with excess skin to the neck. We, did, we resected quite a lot of skin from the neck and then divided the platysma, so that's her at three weeks, much improved. And then rhinoplasty. Now, because I'm running out of time, I'll, I'll go through quite quickly. 50% of my practice is rhinoplasty. Um, it's been described as the most difficult procedure in aesthetic surgery. There's a huge psychological component to rhinoplasty. I think Dr. Veal will dwell on that for, for us. You need to, you need, uh, in my practice, everybody gets screened for anxiety and body dysmorphia and for depression. So that's an open approach where all the, uh, that's, those are the lower lateral cartilages exposed. So I got a young lady who came to see me with uh, over projection of the dosum of the nose. And so what I did was I took down the septum and that's her seven months later. Similarly, another young lady, she didn't like the convex appearance of her face. So we did an open, open rhinoplasty procedure and that's her six months later. Genioplasty, that's my favorite procedure. I call this the icing on the cake. So essentially, it's to um, restore facial harmony and balance. You get some patients, you know, patients with microgenia, so the chin is small, or retrognathia, where the chin sits behind. I'll show you some pictures as well. I put this diagram just to illustrate how you assess somebody who needs a, a genioplasty. There's a nose, upper lip, chin line. You draw that from the midpoint of the nose right down to the upper lip, and then, you know, in those who've got retrognathia or microgenia, in males, this line should, this, the chin should be touching that line, and in, in females, it should be about two millimeters posterior. If you draw a, a vertical line and it's behind that, then, mo, the mo, then most likely they would benefit from a genioplasty. Other surgeons use uh, you know, chin implants. I prefer genioplasty because I, I feel you've got better control. You need to warn them about damage to the mental nerves that come out from the um, mental foramen. It sits, about, it sits between the uh, the first and the second premolar, so you need to warn them about injury to that, otherwise you'll end up with permanent numbness. So I got a young lady who came to see me, you know, poorly defined jawline, the, ne the, the um, neck, you know, fusing with the jaws. She had a type 2 malocclusion, but she didn't want orthognathic surgery, so I did a genioplasty with liposuction, and that's uh, literally two weeks, two weeks later. Similarly, another gentleman, so he has, um, both microgenia and retrognathia. So just imagine you draw a line straight down, right down, so it's sitting behind. So he had an eight millimeter advancement, and that's you no know, big difference. So in terms of facial balance, another gentleman in his 50s, you can see the lower third of the face is deficient. So he had a genioplasty as well, and he sees you know, facial harmony and balance restored. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great profession to be in. It's challenging, you're constantly learning. 
what you need to be is you need to be open and honest with your patients and above all you need to listen to your patients. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much Ivo. Um, Ivo gave us a, a whistle -top, stop tour of um, all plastic surgery uh, techniques uh, used in uh, aesthetics, uh, I think mostly all of them, and he's also highlighted the risks. So those of you who actually see patients postoperatively or preoperatively know about all the risks and he highlighted very nicely all the risks for every single procedure and he also went into uh, a little detail about the techniques. So the next speaker we have, because we only can affect the uh, hair follicles which current stage of growth, you know, and the hair follicles which in a dormant period we can't affect. So 20% of the hair follicles always will be in about dormant stage, of the, so they wouldn't be affected, so they can be reawakened. So after each treatment the growth of the hair will be reduced, so that's what our aim is. That's why hair reduction is more appropriate term. Thank you. Just give the hair to me. <laughs> I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Um, I'm actually I find it increasingly disturbing to see how many rather beautiful in the first place uh, women and men uh, in the uh, essentially celebrity industry, whatever you know, who didn't need to do anything to their to their faces, as far as I can see, and have actually gone to do. Uh, surgeries of all sorts and actually are looking, uh, uh, in fact, uh, um, ugly, if I may say, and with faces that are completely uh, transformed and uh, terrible. And so my question is really, for, and I'm not sure they've all got, you know, body dysmorphic disorder uh, to start with, so my question is to the surgeons is, you know, when, when do you actually say no or, you know, when do you say stop enough or, you know, where are the limits because, uh, they're diff very difficult to see from the outside. You're, I mean, you're right. It's, it's, a real, it's a gut feeling. You know, if somebody's... I had a guy who saw me two months ago. He said he were, he'd been an amateur boxer for 30 years and all his colleagues were laughing at him because he didn't have a boxer's nose. So I said, um, he said, could you give me a boxer's nose? So, so I said, well, it, it, I mean, he was, he, it went on and on and on, so I said, come back next week for a second consultation. So I then explained to him, I said, I'm used to taking abnormal looking noses to normal noses. I don't know how to take a normal nose to make it into an abnormal nose. And what's a boxer's nose? You know, it's a gut feeling you have to say no when you feel something's not quite right. Dr. Chim? I think one third of the patients who come for consultation for aesthetic interventions, they were normally turned away, you know, so, and um, because either the expectation is incorrectly set or the, what the gut feeling of the doctor says, you know, it's roughly it's about a third of the patients, we have to say no. And, uh, for example, in my practice, and I know that some of my colleagues do the same, we've got the special gradation system, you know, when we give the score of the suitability for the patient. And if they were scored above um, a certain uh, level, then we can proceed with the proper consultation. If they underscored, then we probably have to wrap it up very quickly. You know, so, And uh, that um, screening process was based on, uh, again, on a certain criteria for the risk of the patient. You know, so and uh, how they describe the, what they want to achieve. If they start showing you photographs of somebody else and they want to look like this, that is definitely no. <laughs> right, well, I'd like um, for you all to give a, a, a big warm applause to our three wonderful speakers. I think they did a really grand job to give this overview in aesthetic surgery and also to cover body dysmorphic disorder to such a great extent. I, I'm sure there's a lot of learning there. And also a big thank you to Andrew and Emma for, for facilitating the secretariat and our IT guys at the back there.
So please uh, fill in your forms and get some reflection in there in order for you to get your CPD. And do uh, register and come along to the next webinar in a few weeks' time. So thanks very much for attending, uh, both here and uh, in webinar land. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.